Today we will visualize depth first search on an undirected graph. Now what is a graph? A graph is just a series of nodes connected by an edge. The edges could be directed or undirected. In our case, the edges are undirected, meaning that a node can travel back and forth via an edge. One way to represent the graph is using an adjacency list. An adjacency list is a mapping of nodes to its connected neighbors. You can implement this as a map with the key being a node and the value being a list of nodes that are connected. So here we have a graph on the right and its corresponding adjacency list on the left. Now let us go over the algorithm for depth first search. The idea of depth first search is that we want to search as far as possible along a path before searching another path, also known as backtracking. The algorithm stops when all nodes have been searched. There are two popular ways to implement depth first search, an iterative approach using a stack or a recursive approach leveraging the call stack. We will be visualizing the recursive approach because it is easier to implement but harder to visualize. We will use a set to keep track of all the neighbors we want to visit as well as all of the neighbors we have already visited to avoid revisiting them again. If we don't, we will run into infinite recursion. Notice that we also have a helper function called DFS helper to help drive the recursive part of the implementation. First, we make a call to the helper function with our starting node. Since each function call is stored in the call stack until it finishes executing, we will store this call into our call stack. The helper function then checks if our node is in the set. It is not, so we add the node to our visited set. Next, we look at our graph, which is represented by an adjacency list to see if it has any neighbors. We can see that one has four neighbors, two, three, four, and five. So we iterate through the neighbors and pick one randomly, which happens to be node five. Now we call our DFS helper on node five and add it to the top of our call stack. This marks the beginning of our recursive journey. At DFS helper five, since five has not been visited, we add it to our visited set and then proceed to pick one of its neighbors, node six. Here we call DFS helper on node six and add it to the call stack. At DFS helper six, since six hasn't been visited, we add it to our visited set and pick its neighbor, which happens to be five. We call DFS helper on node five and add it to the call stack. At DFS helper five, because five has been visited, we hit our early return condition. Because this function has finished executing, we can pop it off the call stack. At this point, we will take the top of the call stack, which is DFS helper six, and execute its remaining operations, which is back inside the for loop. Here, we pick another neighbor, node seven, and call DFS helper on node seven and add it to the call stack. At DFS helper seven, since node seven hasn't been visited, we add it to our visited set and pick one of its neighbors, node six, and invoke DFS helper on node six. Since node six has been visited, we return, pop it off the stack, and execute from where we left off in DFS helper seven, which is in the for loop. In DFS helper seven, we find another neighbor, node four, we call DFS helper on node four and add it to the call stack. At DFS helper four, since node four hasn't been visited, we add it to our visited set and pick one of its neighbors, node seven, and evoke DFS helper on node seven. At DFS helper seven, since node seven has been visited, we return, pop it off the call stack, and go back to DFS helper four. At DFS helper four, we find another neighbor, node one, and call DFS helper on node one and add it to the call stack. At DFS helper one, since node one has been visited, we return, pop it off the call stack, and return to DFS helper four. At DFS helper four, we find the last neighbor, node three, and call DFS helper on node three and add it to the call stack. At DFS helper three, since node three has not been visited, we add it to our visited set and pick a neighbor. At this point, since node three's neighbors, 
1 and 4 are already visited, you should have a good idea on what is going to happen next. Now we will see a chain reaction of the call stack clearing out because the node in each call in the call stack was the last neighbor in its respective for loop. It was not directly because its neighbors have all been visited, because if it was, we would have been doing the extra step of putting those invocations into the call stack and popping them off one by one. Now at DFS helper 1, we find its last neighbor, node 2, and call DFS helper on node 2 and add it to the call stack. Even though we can see that all nodes have been visited, we still need to wait for our call stack to finish executing everything on its stack. Now that our call stack is empty, we have successfully executed our original call to DFS helper 1, and so our DFS is now completed. You might have noticed that toward the end, the DFS seems to be quite inefficient when it unnecessarily iterates the same nodes more than once. This is a major reason why iterative approaches, as well as caching approaches, like memoization and dynamic programming are superior in terms of space and runtime efficiency. Hopefully this visualization was helpful. If you like this video, please make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks.